Oh, I know. One other thought that I, in uh, assessing this year in science, I, I talked about omega, the cosmological constant, uh, and that is really incredible. In fact, let me do a personal breast-beating thing and point out to you that this thing that they have come upon, omega, the cosmological constant, this absolutely, you know, 50 years ago or so, Einstein called it the biggest blunder I ever made because he played with the, uh, the necessity of this thing to keep the universe from falling in on itself. And then he decided it was an unnecessary construct and that it, it led to such weird I, conclusions that it had to be gotten rid of. And so that was all very well and good until the, these recent measurements of the distances of certain supernova carried out independently by several teams of astrophysicists brought the news that uh, the universe is expanding faster than the laws of physics allow. And when they looked at how much faster, they realized that it called the cosmological constant back into existence. Well, but here there are a couple of things about this cosmological constant that are very counterintuitive. The first is uh, that it, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it acts on empty space. It, isn't, it does not require matter to manifest. It is a property of space itself, the cosmological constant. The second thing is, it's, uh, it's a repulsive force it, that is growing stronger and stronger. Forces don't grow stronger and stronger. They grow weaker and weaker. Gravity grows weaker, light grows weaker, everything grows weaker. This force, as time progresses, gets stronger and stronger. Well, that means when you project it out toward, you know, billions of years into the future, it becomes the dominant force. It, be it overcomes gravity, it overcomes the strong force, the weak force, it overcomes all the forces, it becomes the dominant force. The other thing about it is that it becomes stronger not on an even slope, but asymptotically it becomes stronger. Well, now, this produces something very much like what I've been yakking about uh, since 1971, the novelty wave, the so-called time wave. It, too, grows stronger and stronger through time, and it, too, has this kind of built-in asymptotic acceleration where it uh, experiences a kind of inflationary expansion in power. The two map over each other very well. But when you talk, returning now to the cosmological constant, when, you ask, when the astrophysical community realized the consequences of taking this on board, they realized that it was dissolving the entire model of what cosmology has been throughout the 20th century. Because what it's really saying this discovery, less than six months old, <laughs> is that space itself is in the act of exploding, that the universe is, is on the cusp of a, uh, an inflationary phase of expansion similar to the inflationary expansion that occurred at the time of the Big Bang. What would this look like? What would it feel like? Nobody can even imagine. It is not upon us. I don't mean that. But I mean that in the near future of the universe, in the next uh, billion or two billion years, things will change very, very dramatically. Uh, everything will begin to rearrange itself according to the expression of this asymptotic power. So that, that was uh, the biggest news in astrophysics. The other news, which has psychedelic implications, I think, also comes from astrophysics. As you may recall, last uh, August, I think it was, I can't remember exactly, every man, woman, and child on Earth got the equivalent of a dental x-ray when uh, there was a, uh, a thing called a, a star quake on a, uh, 
on a magnetar, a magnetic neutron star 20,000 light years away, experienced a catastrophic collapse. And there was a wave of gamma rays that were, that were it, well, turned on every light in the system when it hit the planet. Uh, and there no, an event like that had never been observed before. And I got to thinking about this, and I realized, you know, well, we've only been looking for this, this kind of thing for 30 years. There's probably a, quite a bit of this kind of anomalous, high-energy, short-duration fluctuation of radiation going on in the galaxy. And then I had a kind of an image, I wouldn't say a vision, but a kind of an image of... Uh, of how things are really arranged uh, on the larger level in terms of the galaxy. And I, the image was of a donut. And, you know, we're accustomed to being told that we're at the, out at the edge of the Milky Way where stars are few and far between, that this is the boonies, in <laughs> other words. But I'll bet you the boonies are where biology thrives because the low star density and the distance from the galactic core and these extremely energetic events at the core would create a kind of uh, donut situation where it's the toroidal area out near the rim where stars are slow burning and they don't collide with each other and planets can form and you get uh, the five billion year run you need to get to a civilization. But <laughs> Uh, you know, our uh, a rule of biology and strategy and everything and religious practice as far as that's concerned is seek the light. Well, the light is at the core. And so then I saw, aha, maybe the true seeking of the light requires biology to go into partnership with something beyond biology because the environment at the core is so energetic and I'm not suggesting the, the actual core, that's beyond contemplation, that's a black hole. No technology imaginable can, can get even near the event horizon of an object like that. Mm -hmm. But I mean in the vicinity of the galactic core where you know, there are star, the star density is two to three hundred times greater than it is in our vicinity. Uh, those kinds of environments are so fraught with peril for, for biology that probably downloading ourselves into machine symbiotes of some sort is the only, is the only way to go to those places. In, in one of Greg Egan's novels, he pictures a, a human future where this is one option. You can fuse yourself with a starship and set out to check out the neighborhood. Or you can join the Amish and uh, till rye uh, in Pennsylvania. Actually, I think you can't do that because something's happened to the Earth. But some Hamish possibility is still uh, available. Well, this is not like... Uh, the sort of uh, thing the other faculty members will be talking to you about, which is an intense and, and primarily important download of the, in the, the homework, the chemistry, the botany, the behavioral impact, the archaeology, the ethnography of, uh, of these substances. I ask myself all the time, you know, how are we different from other people? Are we morally superior? Are we smarter? Are we richer? Are we kinder to the people we meet? And actually, the longer I look, the less I can tell. Uh, uh, there are extraordinary examples of all of these things in and outside of our community, and extraordinary nudniks and jerks inside and outside. Uh, our community, but we have in our hands tools that I think if people were correctly presented with them and understood without hype and hysteria and hyperbole what this psychedelic enterprise is about, that we would 
win them to our cause because our cause is uh, the human cause. Mm -hmm.